Hello, my name is Dr. Jim Doty, and I'm the host of the Into the Magic Shop podcast, where we explore the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Hi, this is Dr. Jim Doty, host of the Into the Magic Shop podcast. My guest today is Emma Seppala, PhD, who I've known for many years as she's the science director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. Emma is also a faculty member at the Yale School of Management and is the director of the Women's Leadership Program. She is a psychologist and research scientist by training with an expertise in the science of happiness, emotional intelligence, and social connection. Her best-selling book, The Happiness Track, has been published in numerous languages, and today we're going to talk about her new book, which will be published in April of 2024, called Sovereign. How do we take sovereignty over our lives? I hope you enjoy our conversation today. Emma, it's uh, so great to uh, have you uh, with me this morning. And um, for our listeners who may not know, Emma and I have known each other for several years. She's worked with me at the Center for Compassion and Altruism uh, Research and Education, uh, which she continues uh, to be our science director. And she's also uh, at Yale now uh, involved with their uh, leadership management program. And the other thing about Emma is she is an author. Uh, she was the um, leading editor of the Handbook for Compassion Science by Oxford Press, as well as uh, wrote a best-selling book uh, called The Happiness Track. What we're here to talk about today, though, is her new book. And uh, I'm really excited about it. Uh, uh, she was kind enough to um, send me a PDF of the book. And it's called Sovereign. For many of you, you may know not know what that term means uh, or how Emma is using it. But maybe, Emma, you can explain to us what you mean by that term um, to sort of set us on the right track as we talk about this book. Yeah, first of all, Dr. Doty, it's such a pleasure to be here with you, um, dear mentor, friend, um, someone I deeply admire and, and, and love. So thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so, so grateful. Um, yes. So the term sovereign, um, and the way I'm talking about it in the book is that it's about a deeply life supportive relationship with yourself that therefore allows you to, um, to live according to your, your fullest, greatest potential. Um, and in many ways, Dr. Doty, you are, um, an exemplar of someone who, who lives, um, who is sovereign in the sense that you um, really do live to the fullest expression of who you are um, in a life supportive way and as such make such a difference um, in the world around you uh, and are able to do it in a sustained way. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, to go deeper into that. No, I, I think it's important that you do because uh, first of all, for many, it's a foreign term, but also um, maybe you can give us examples of when someone is sort of acting sovereign in terms of themselves versus uh, those who are not, because I think many people are not aware of how protecting their sovereignty uh, actually empowers them to uh, thrive. And uh, if they're not aware of it, oftentimes they limit themselves or in some ways give up their agency. Absolutely. And I think, um, Dr. Doty, you and I have seen many exemplars, examples of you know, people who, who seem really successful at Stanford and Silicon Valley and beyond um, and uh, you know, at, at, on campuses like Stanford, for example, they're, they're doing really great and so forth, and yet they are um, also subject to so much burnout uh, and unhappiness. And there is there's a mismatch, right, between that those two things. What's going on here? So I'll share an example of a Yale Facebook um, Yale alumni Facebook group that I'm on, and I I happened to look on it one day, and there was a question set by the administrator, which was, "What do you do for a living?" and um, how what would you how would you advise someone who wants to get into that profession? An innocent question, and yet the 
answers that came in, first of all, did not answer the question, but it was a lot of highly successful people who were answering. And they were saying things like, don't do things for money, don't do things for prestige. And these are people who were high level physicians and lawyers. A lot of them were actually high level physicians and lawyers and, and other individuals who ha were very successful. And yet here they were sharing, you know, that how unhappy they also were. And, you know, I think, and um, let me know if, if you if you agree, I think we, we both have seen how, you know, there are so many people who are striving so hard to prove their significance. There are a lot of people out there trying to prove their significance and yet um, uh, they're actually really unhappy. And so what's going on there is that they're living in this sort of bound state of, of a sort of self-destructive state. And that's why we're seeing so much burnout um, among high, high achieving people, but just generally burnout levels are really high right now. And, um, and living in a more sovereign state is having a more uh, a healthier relationship with oneself that is life supportive as opposed to uh, to self-destructive. And, you know, whenever I ask audiences, how many of you are highly self-critical, pretty much everyone raises their hand. And we know from, from psychology, self-criticism is a form of self-loathing. And how many people are walking around with self-loathing? Most people. And yet, if they could shift that relationship with themselves, then the sky is the limit in terms of their potential to show up as their absolute best self with all of their gifts and talents. Well, that's interesting. Uh, tell me how this, uh, as an example, uh, a lot of work has been uh, done on, if you want to call it the blue zones. And um, do you think when you look back at how people lived a few hundred years ago, you know, they were in a village, they were born there, they died there. Um, they lived in intergenerational families. Everyone in the village knew them, typically were very supportive. Even knowing the good and the bad about them, they still gave unconditional love or they were accepted. Do you think the transition to modern society is in part responsible for this uh, hypercriticality that so many people have? Well, it's really interesting because the way that I'm thinking about this this hypercriticality, as you say, it's it's like a program that's running in most people's minds. And it, it doesn't have to be there, but it is there. And it is inherited oftentimes. You'll find, okay, my, my, my parents were like this and their parents were like this. And it's because it doesn't make sense when you think about it, being having a self-destructive relationship with yourself, even if it's just in the words you use towards yourself and the way you relate to yourself, it doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is to have a life supportive relationship with ourselves. So why are we running these programs, these destructive programs? And so your question about sort of more traditional cultures is really interesting because, and I, I know that you're you're familiar with this, but to, for example, um, Tibetan Buddhists or or um, or, or other or other faiths such as um, the Hindu faith and, and other Eastern traditions, this idea of um, having a, a self loathing is foreign because there's the sense that you're really fortunate to be living in a human body as opposed to having been born a worm or some something else, right? So um, this idea that this life is such a precious opportunity to learn, to grow, to serve, to, to be there for others. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, whether it's uh, being thankful for not uh, <laughs> being born a worm, uh, uh, but uh, for uh, not having that constant environment where you feel unsure of yourself, where you don't know who you can trust, I think in part, uh, that's what modern society has created for so many people. As you know, uh, in most situations in modern society, you do not live in an intergenerational family. You do not have people who you've known your entire life immediately there for you. So uh, you have this concern that you're going to be judged. And unfortunately, the nature of modern society is you have to have a job typically. Uh, you have to function in that job. And I think uh, so many people are concerned uh, that they won't live up to this idealized projection of themselves. And in some ways, uh, it results in what happens with influencers who, you know, they put on all this makeup or they use all these filters to give a projection of themselves, which isn't their true self. No, that's so true. And I love that you you bring that up because, so I, I've broken the, the 
book up chapter by chapter in terms of how we abandon our sovereignty and then how we can regain it in terms of every level of our life from our, our self, our emotions, our mind, our body, and so forth. And um, when I was writing the mind chapter, I was really looking at, you know, at some some of the statistics around just how much information we take in every day, and it's it's over sixty thousand gigabytes of information we're taking in from from influencers, from television, from radio, from podcasts, from um, gaming, all the different ways that individuals interact with technologies. It's at least sixty thousand gigabytes, and that was double what was uh, the you know what was uh, researched five years prior. And these numbers are older; they're not twenty twenty three; they're from twenty twenty, and um, so. It's it's uh, when you think about sovereignty of mind, how can we have sovereignty of mind when we are so when we are ingesting so much media and information that how 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 can we not be deeply influenced by what comes our way? We are what we eat is also true of our mind. And so that's why I think it's also really hard sometimes for people to actually connect to themselves because there's so much coming at them. And so one way to regain sovereignty there is to really start to filter out and select the messaging that you that will nourish your mind as opposed to fill it with more garbage that leads to you desiring something or feeling like you're not enough, et cetera, but al- allows you to live a, a, a wiser life, like the, the kind of messaging that you put out into the world um, that is nourishing. And also um, making time to uh, clear clear our minds um, through practices like meditation and so forth that I know you also um, recommend. Well, and that's an interesting aspect is uh, uh, what are the mechanisms uh, to change your mind? You mentioned meditation, which I think a lot of people um, make it harder than it is. Yeah. And maybe you can comment on that. And because in some ways, for a subset of people, you say meditation and they think of a monk sitting with their legs crossed. Uh, but in some ways, it's not really that. It's a type of mind training uh, that liberates you. Oh, absolutely. And and sitting at, at, with in, in meditation in lotus posture as a, first, uh, as a first try is going to be probably not such a great experience for everyone, especially with the levels of sort of anxiety that we're dealing with in our society. I know that I first started meditation or tried to develop a meditation practice um, was right after 9-11 in Manhattan when I, I was living there. And sitting down and closing my eyes and trying to be mindful was just making me much more aware of how anxious I was. And it was a disaster. You know, try as hard as I could. that It wasn't going to work for me. And um, and so I ended up doing uh, a breathing technique called sky breath meditation that I ended up doing research on. And that was what was more helpful to get me into a more settled state of mind. Um, so breathing to change my physiology ended up clearing my mind. And that was what worked for me. And I feel like, you know, people have to really find what works for them. But the research we ended up doing 10 years later with veterans is I was, again, working with veterans and thinking, how can we help them? They're so anxious. Some of them can't even close their eyes, let alone meditate. Um, but doing the breathing helped them with their trauma, helped them with their anxiety. So they were able to gain regain sovereignty because it's really hard to have sovereignty when there's so much trauma. And so many people are walking around with layers of trauma. So how can we address that? And when you address that, then you can regain sovereignty of mind. Well, I think that's a good point where you talk about uh, how so many people carry baggage, which oftentimes they don't even understand or appreciate that the baggage that they carry frequently from uh, childhood, but as you point out, uh, veterans uh, as well, uh, actually impacts every decision they make. It impacts the relationships they have, uh, the decisions they make, uh, the jobs they take. And if you have no awareness of it, uh, it's it's hard to change. And so, um, and I think you'll agree that on some level, everyone is suffering. It's how do you minimize the suffering uh, that, frankly, uh, you're creating for yourself. And maybe you can just comment on uh, that aspect and some of the the reality that uh, uh, we create our own suffering. Yeah, it's so interesting to me. You know, I always think about, you know, what is one of the biggest issues that we have at work in our relationships in our life? It's that we don't really know how to handle our emotions or, or like I said, our suffering. And um, 
it's wild to me that no matter how many, you know, PhDs, MDs, uh, you know, dishes, you know how to cook, languages, you know how to speak, you know, black belts you have, uh, most people are walking around with as much edu formal education about how to handle negative emotions as a five-year-old, which means none. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it, it, and it's wild because, and then you get people in leadership positions or in major positions or leading a family and they're unable to handle their own emotions. We haven't been taught. So when I've asked audiences, you know, okay, so what have you been taught? Audiences from around the world are going to say the same thing. Suppress, like just stuff it, stuff your emotions in. And so the consequences of that, we know both from research and practice is that, you know, it leads to either explosion at some point in some inappropriate manner or, or implosion with um, all sorts of psychosomatic um, um, symptoms that come up. And it, and it's also leads to worse relationship outcomes because we all know what it feels like to be around someone who's suppressing and then passive aggressive. And the cycle is destructive both for the person and for, for whoever they're interacting with. So, you know, uh, it's, it's wild that we don't have that education, but what research shows is that actually emotions, when they, when you let them, when you actually experience them the way that a child does, like a child would just lie on the floor and scream. You know, something like an adult would just try to stuff that emotion in, but the child screams and two minutes later, it's done. It's digested the emotion. And as adults, we haven't learned that. On the contrary, and I know you talk about this a lot when you talk about addiction and so forth, we just, we suppress and then it's like, how do you cope? Well, let's let's drink, let's eat, let's let's shop, let's do porn, let's gamble, let's whatever it is, right? Just constantly consuming in some manner to try and cope. And that's just, that's just an addictive cycle that just continues the suffering. And if we were if we were able to just sit like in meditation or in breathing and just be with the emotion, just like a child is, not that you want to explode on people, but <laughs> in private, you can at least digest the emotion, then we could be more free from it and have more emotional sovereignty. But the thing is, most people don't want to suffer or want to go through the pain, but not understanding that the addiction itself or the suppression itself is worse suffering and it drags that emotion out. No, no, that's that's very true. You know, you were you mentioned earlier how uh, uh, gaining sovereignty over your mind. But uh, maybe we can talk about the other aspects you talk about in the book in terms of over your bodies, et cetera, uh, and uh, uh, sort of get some idea of what you mean by that exactly. Yeah, so let's talk about the sovereign, sovereign relationships since you just brought that up also about relationships. Uh, and then we could talk about the body too. Um, so, you know, a relationship is another domain that's really important to us and that we've never been educated on and um if anything we've been educated you know from movies and so forth which you're supposed to sort of find this ideal match and then you're supposed to and they're going to complete your life like that's just such a it's such a crazy thing when you think about so sort of the myths that are sort of programmed into our mind uh, of this i need someone else to complete me but if two people feel that way it's not going anywhere it's not going to go anywhere you have two empty cups right so um, I'm going to share, I'm going to start with a, a story, if you don't mind, that's a, a, of one of my college friends. So she, um, uh, she was, she, she's an activist. She is um, an environmental activist, human rights activist, who is really amazing. Um, and she spends much of her time in Africa and South America in the jungles, uh, researching, you know, um, deforestation and what's going on. So she was in this African country and uh, where deforestation was happening because of a rubber company there. And she was investigating that rubber company. And what she does is, you know, she'll invite she'll invite the rubber company not to deforest. And when they ignore her, she will then go to the New York Times and give them all the evidence. They'll go check and then they do a big expose and they force this company to change their ways, um, which is which is genius, really. But um, what she was, she was in this jungle and she had to go back to the airport and it was three hours away and her driver disappeared. Now the rubber company was giving financial kickbacks to the leadership of this country. They had an interest in not having my friend there. Uh, Itel is her name. So all of a sudden a, another car appears and everybody's like, get in this car. And it's got two muscle strapped individuals in military apparel that are clearly, clearly her hit men, right? They, but she has no choice. She gets in this car with these people. So she gets in the car and during the span of the, that, of the time she's in the car with them, she managed to, to not only not be killed by these, <laughs> by these men, but that they, they share their snacks with her. They protect her. They drive her all the way to the airport. They even at one point hold up a little sheet while she relieves herself by the side of the road. How did she do this? 
And she gets confirmation that they were her hitmen when they drop her off at the airport and they say, do not ever come back here. You are not safe here. But if you do choose to come back, come over a land border under our protection and stay with us. So what did what happened? Like, how did she do this? She has positive relational energy. What is that? She has this ability to have a life supportive relationship with other people, which Dr. Doty, you have so much of uh, in your relationship, both with, with individuals like me, but also with, with your audiences, with, with your readers. And what is that? That's an, an energy that you, where you are giving life. You have a life supportive relationship with people. Now we all know what it feels like to be around someone and leave their presence and feel like more depleted and down, right? And then there's other people, you leave their presence, you feel uplifted, you feel energized, you feel inspired, enthusiastic. That is what positive, um, uh, positively, positive relational energy is. And Etel has that. And so she was able to turn her hitmen into her protectors that way. But we all have the ability to have this. Now, this is a research um, conducted by Kim Cameron and colleagues, who I know you know him, the University of Michigan. Um, and what they found is that when there are individuals like this in a company, there is a massive amount of productivity that happens around them, way more than anywhere else. And the reason is that they are life-giving. And in so doing, they generate that around them. But the interesting thing is that that life-giving relationship is not just unidirectional. And I think you probably, from your experience, have, have felt this as well. It's not just, it's not like physical energy, which drains with use. As you exert positively relation, positive relational energy, you in turn get re-energized. Don't you feel that when you're, when you're moving an audience with your words, don't you also feel like you're re-energized in the process? No, no, I think that's exactly correct. And, and obviously, uh, when you're able to do that and you feel that energy, of course, uh, that motivates you. And to uh, you know, continue with those types of actions. And again, as you said, I think everyone has the ability to have this. They just need to be, if you will, shown the path how to get there. And I think that's what uh, your book, in some ways, does. Yeah, absolutely. It's completely learnable, and uh, it, it it's has a lot to do with the values that you have. Um, and for, I mean, you obviously have a deeply held the deeply held value of compassion, but you also have integrity and honesty and kindness, and all of those things are very positively energizing. Sometimes people will think, oh well, if I'm not an extrovert. I guess I can't. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what values do you stand by and do you live by. Because people will feel that around you. They will feel safe around you. They will feel um, uh, they can let their guard down. They will feel that uh, you have their back. And, and all of those things are tremendous for us. Our number one thing we look for is, am I safe? And then am I seen? Am I heard? Am I valued? Am I cared for? And those are that is what, you're, what you do. Um, but the other aspect, of course, is how you take care of yourself, right? So that's, that's the, the, the going back to the point we made, and we made earlier that when you're taking care of yourself and have a life supportive relationship with yourself, you can have a, a very vibrantly um, positive relationship with others. You know, talking about this, I, I could see, though, how potentially if you give some uh, individuals sort of these principles and they start manifesting them, how actually in some ways, though, it could be very disruptive to their life because uh, if they have chosen a, uh, has chosen a path that is not healthy or uh, sort of mires them in a variety of negative uh, emotions, uh, then this could be highly, highly disruptive. Yeah. So tell me more about this. Well, as an example, uh, we're talking about people's baggage. If somebody had an abusive childhood, oftentimes uh, they choose an abusive partner. And then, as an example, if suddenly they say, I don't have to be in this situation, this isn't healthy for me, I now realize the drivers of my behavior, then, of course, that requires action. Yep. And so uh, uh, I think... Some people might be even fearful of that because, as you know, uh, even though the known is not good, the unknown can be very scary. Absolutely. It re sovereignty requires courage. So thanks for bringing that up because it's it's essential. You have to have the courage, but what, you're having the courage to, should I, do I want, do I want to live the life that I want to live? 
Or do I want to die regretting I didn't live the life I wanted to live? Do I want to live a life where I was my own best friend? Or do I want to live a life where I was my enemy? When we you know, ask ourselves this question, especially given how short life is, and I don't that sounds trivial, but I think it's become really obvious in the last couple of years just how it could go. It could go in a second. And so many people's regrets on their deathbed are, are that they didn't live the life they wanted. And I think, especially after the pandemic, people are realizing they want to live life on their own terms. How are they going to live it? And it requires courage. It absolutely does. And I always think of this quote by Maya Angelou who said, I learned a long time ago that the best thing I could do is to be on my own side. And I love that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as I said, the, you know, I think therein lies the challenge, uh, um, you know, for a lot of people is that, uh, you know, how do they get there? And, you know, some people may sit there and say, well, you know, that's easy for you to say. But uh, I, I think you will agree that uh, it is available to everyone. Uh, but the key is to have the courage to take that uh, first step. It is. It's absolutely essential. Um, and uh, I want to share another quote, too, by Audre Lorde. Sometimes people think, well, isn't that self-indulgent? You know, I should be doing other things for other people. And what I think oftentimes people don't realize is that when you are taking care of yourself, you're going to show up so much better for others that it's actually an act of service. And when you don't have a good relationship with yourself, you're depriving the world of the gift that you could be, right? Because if you look at like what you're doing, you're spreading so much positivity and hope to people everywhere. That's enormous. Everyone has that ability, not necessarily on stage and writing best-selling books, but in their own community and in their own way. So Audre Lorde is a self-described, you know, activist. She was a writer, poet, and a self-described um, a black gay, a gay black woman in a straight white man's world. Uh, you know, fighting her, her the many battles that she had to in her own life, and she said, uh, you know. Um, Self-care is not self-indulgence. It's an act of political warfare. And I find that really powerful because how are you going to show up on the battlefield of your life? Limping because you kicked your way there or in, you know, spanking, shining, bright armor because you loved your way there? Well, that's, uh, you know, I, I think an interesting point because, um, you know, I've observed sometimes that uh, there's a subset of people who um, have had challenging backgrounds, wow. and they seem to uh, diverge. There's one subset of people who say, you know, I've really suffered, and uh, I know what it's like to suffer. I accept the situation, and um, I know how to be kind to myself, which means I also know how others feel and act towards them in a positive way. Or sadly, you have the subset of people who translate this narrative into no one helped me. Uh, everyone was against me. I had to fight to overcome it. And people suffering isn't my problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's why I think, you know, that first step of, of healing trauma is so important. Because for some people, it just feels like too much. It's just too much to do anything beyond just get through the day. Um, but uh, the, the, the trauma healing is, is so important here. Because of course, you know, if you feel like your own cup is empty, it, it can feel like, how can, I, how can I even do anything more that I'm already doing? Um, and I think for, you know, our research shows that the, the breathing, the sky breathing is so powerful, but there are other modalities as well. And, um, I, you know, I would encourage, and I hope that more and more of this gets widespread for people to learn about ways that they can heal their trauma other than, you know, the, the, the traditional, just, just the drugs that, you know, that are administered. There are other ways as well that are life supportive. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned drugs, uh, uh, because, I think, unfortunately, in the modern healthcare system, because of the constraints, uh, and you can argue about uh, the cause of all of those constraints, certainly one is uh, related to the corporate practice of medicine, I believe, where doctors become commodities and they're not rewarded for necessarily doing the right thing or being available or having the time. So the easiest thing is just to prescribe. And uh, while that may be a short-term solution, 
it actually causes uh, further uh, problems for individuals. And this idea that you have agency over yourself, I, I think, is really, really powerful because once you change your mindset or how you perceive uh, the world, I think that uh, can actually have an incredibly positive effect. But again, you have to see that for yourself. And then uh, once you see that, then you become the driver of your destiny. So I love that you brought that up. And that that's absolutely what I talk about in Sovereign Body. And it, it's all oh, in that, that chapter, Sovereign Body. It's, it's always so powerful to hear a physician also express this, you know, that many of us see. Um, and one of the examples I, I write about in the, in the body chapter is about this. Uh, he was a barbecue chef, um, JT. He was a, a barbecue chef and he was something like 300 pounds. And he had all of these health issues. I mean, terrible health issues. And he said, no one ever told him to change his diet. And, and he recalls one doctor giving him, and he was already on something like 10 prescriptions and one doctor giving him, uh, telling him, stop living like a 30-year-old and start living like a 40-year-old as he handed him seven more prescriptions. <laughs> Just absolutely shocking to think. And he said, no one ever told me about my diet. It was my mom who suggested maybe I should look into it. And then he became, now he's a vegan chef. He's lost all his weight. He's recovered his health. And I think we're not encouraged to look at ways in which we can take care of our own health. It's that's, And yet that's sovereignty. Of course, some of us have chronic health issues and, and so forth that we can't help. And yet how are how are we living? Are we supporting our body? Like our body is our only home that we'll have for our entire life. And yet we're taught to um, abuse it, if anything, and to judge it and to, uh, you know, feed it all sorts of garbage, stay up, you know, without sleeping for days, um, over exercise or over work or, or under exercise. I mean, the list goes on in terms of what we do um, to our bodies. And what the research shows is that, you know, for example, if you... Um, go from not eating a lot of produce to eating seven or more per day, your happiness and well-being, not just, it's not just your physical health that benefits, of course, but your happiness and well-being goes from um, the happiness of a person who's unemployed to a person that's employed. And we're never taught, we're not taught this. These are not the messages that are being told, you know, marketed out there. We're always being told, here's this new drug. You know, again, drugs can be wonderful and life-saving in some situations. But there is so much agency we also can have over our health if we if we take it if we are if we have the courage to take it take responsibility. Yeah. Well, no, I I, I think uh, uh, those are some interesting points, and in fact, uh, I know I've shared a few stories of patients of mine. You know, one example that uh, uh, comes up in my mind is uh, I had a patient who I was I think the seventh or eighth. Uh, uh, neurosurgeon or spine surgeon she had seen. And she was on several medications for pain, muscle spasm, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, um, and she had been actually told she needed surgery. So I ended up going through her x-rays, examining her. And the problem was that she was looking for an external solution to an internal problem, and uh, which in some ways uh, was her own pain that she was struggling with, which many people transfer their psychic pain into body parts, and whether it's their low back pain, their gastrointestinal tract, their head in terms of headaches and things like this, uh, then they attach to that and they think that is the problem and only until that problem is addressed by some other outside uh, intervention, then I'm never going to be happy or at peace or not have the symptoms. And I spent about an hour and a half with this woman. And at the end of the day, we went through a query of why are you seeing all these doctors? And why do you keep searching for one to, because what she wanted was to say, you need X, and you have to do X, and when you do X, you won't have any more problems. And actually, after a long conversation, uh, she understood that, one, uh, she didn't need any surgery whatsoever, 
Uh, two, frankly, she didn't need any of these medications. Uh, what she needed was to accept herself and understand that her prior traumas, and in this case she had been uh, abused as a child, were manifesting uh, in this way. And uh, with some psychotherapy, uh, she actually came and saw me several months later, and all her symptoms had resolved. And, and, but this is so, so common. And unfortunately, also because of the way uh, medicine is, uh, uh, or physicians are compensated, uh, if you're a surgeon, you get compensated by using your knife. And uh, unfortunately, also in a system where you're not, allowed to, or I should say, you choose not to spend appropriate amount of time, uh, the easiest thing is to cut for many people. And uh, as a result, you have all these people who already are traumatized, then they have an intervention that further traumatizes them, and then they just become sort of addicts to the various and sundry uh, ways to relieve their psychic pain. And so I think that's uh, really, really true. And I would suggest to you uh, in my business, and one aspect of that is being a spine surgeon, is that probably over 70% of the people who undergo these types of interventions don't need them at all. What they need is a person who cares for them. And you mentioned uh, psychological safety, uh, who create an environment of psychological safety. And the reality is the vast majority of people just want to be listened to. Yeah. I just love hearing the the many stories of patients that I've heard from you over the years. You know, I you're not you're you're so much more than a physician. You're a healer. Like you're a, you're addressing a, the person as a whole, mind, body, spirit. What is going on with this person? And frankly, I think you should be in charge of like training in all medical schools to like revamp things a little bit. And you know, because even physicians uh, would benefit so much more um, in their own well being, knowing that they can really truly help a, a human. Uh, regain their sovereignty. No, I think that's right. And I think, uh, as you say, uh, many people are not taught this idea of sovereignty. And uh, I think, uh, especially physicians, uh, you know, the drivers for many people as to why they become physicians aren't necessarily, oh my God, I want to help people. That is the highest uh, level of humanity, if you will, by giving of yourself to be of service to others versus either uh, family parental influence or translating uh, being a physician into monetary reward. And I think it's a, a very, very sad thing that this uh, happens as much as it does. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But you're, you know, you, you are showing us that there's a different way. And I really, truly think that medicine will change because of that, because you, as you know, physician burnout and also mental health issues, the, the rates are, are really high. And um, and one of the reasons is because the physicians are not able to have moments of compassion, which we know helps them uh, curb their burnout. Um, they have no time to be with their patients. So I hope, I hope, truly hope that your message will, um, will help change things. Well, I think uh, hopefully all of us are trying to give people tools, insights, uh, techniques that... Uh, allow them to gain their own self-agency and understand uh, what that means and how uh, their life uh, could possibly change. Now, I would submit, uh, because some people think you and I sitting here talking that we have it all together, our lives are perfect, that we come from these backgrounds where you know, everything was peachy and rosy, and therefore, that's why we're able to do this. And, uh, you know, I just want to emphasize, one, that's not the case. Two, even people who seemingly have, quote unquote, had everything uh, can actually suffer quite deeply and be in uh, pain. And also, uh, I think this is important. All of us have this shadow self. And, you know, it's the part of us that is ashamed of either our actions in the past or the desires we have, and we don't want anybody to know about them. And the reality is all of us have this. And it, number one, most people try to push it away, and they think by pushing it away, yeah, it'll stay away. And the problem with that is that 
when you're in these situations, when you're weak, when you're tired, uh, when you're overworked, that's when the shadow self presents itself and often leads to very negative types of behaviors. So one is you have to, I think, accept your shadow self as part of you, not resist it, accept it, and know that you have to live with it, and that's okay. And you can much better control it, uh, those feelings, but also uh, understand that every one of us is a frail, fragile human being who, in the big scope of things, is trying to be our best selves, but not necessarily with the understanding of how to do that. And books like yours, I think, and others can have that really profound effect to put somebody on a track, if you will, to be sovereign. Um, maybe what you can do is just give us uh, some insights or techniques in each of your sovereign domains that might be takeaways for everyone who's listening here to improve their own lives and uh, uh, become sovereign. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, one interesting um, aspect, so actually just to, to speak back on what you were just sharing, you know, I, um, w during my, during some dark sort of postpartum years, um, my, eldest son who must have been four or something at the time heard me speaking about myself at a time when I was feeling down and I, I said something self-critical and I can't remember now what it was but I then heard him use those words about himself sometime later and I thought oh my gosh you know the buck has to stop here otherwise this program is going to keep running and it's so painful to hear anyone talking like that to talking self-critically about themselves. I remember, you know, it, it, when I was exclusively teaching on Zoom uh, over the the pandemic, there's a time when I asked people, what do you say to yourself when you've just made a really embarrassing mistake? Or, And, you know, people would use the chat box to say all the words that they used to tear their own self down with. It was painful to read all those chats coming in. And then I would ask, okay, so your best friend calls you in an hour and has made a terribly embarrassing mistake. What do you say to them? And put it in the chat. And again, and then you see these beautiful sentences of support and kindness uh, and it, it, very life supportive, right? The first, the first list is, is, is depleting and the second list is enlivening. And then I, again, I asked, why the difference? What's the difference between you and your best friend. There's zero difference. There's only one, and you live in different bodies. That's it. And so, you know, question, I, I guess my, my biggest thing is question. Question the programs running in your mind that are keeping you small, that are keeping you in pain, that are keeping you constricted, because they're just a program. You know, it is no, there's no, the, 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 but once the questioning starts, because it makes zero sense, that's when you can start to, start to move out of it, right? Um, so th that's, you know, that's one thing I, I often share because um, it's like when you go to a new country or a new culture, or a new state, a new city, I mean, there's a different culture wherever you go, right? And so I, I know when I first moved from France where I grew up to the States, you know, in France, everybody's always complaining, like that's the that's the uh, the way that you connect with another person is complaining about the weather or whatever it is. <laughs> it's the the dialectic of complaint. And then you come to the U.S. And people don't have time for complaints here. I mean, that's just not something people do. And I saw that. I was like, you know what? I like this better. I I never really had fun complaining. It's not my thing. I really I prefer this. The more positive sort of perspective on things. You know, it, 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 U.S. culture has this other kinds of programming that could be more destructive, like the constantly overworking. But my point being is that sometimes you'll enter a new culture and see people doing things differently. And as you see people doing things differently, you realize, oh, the way I've always been doing things isn't the only way. It's also not necessarily the best way. I actually have a choice here. So that's that's what I'm I, I'm inviting. I mean, I invite people to question the the ways the programs that are running in their mind that are that are destructive to them and inviting them into a new possibility. No, I think that's uh, that's exactly right, and I think. One of the things that can be helpful as well is 
uh, and you can do it every morning. And uh, it can be written or just uh, verbal or sort of internal talking to yourself is to say, uh, what do I like about myself? What are my best aspects to reaffirm uh, actually who you are? Because I, I would suggest uh, most, most people have incredibly positive things about themselves. And when they hear it, uh, it reaffirms that and actually puts that out there in a, uh, in some ways, a life-affirming way. And, uh, and also to sit there and say, um, how can I challenge myself to be who I want to be? What is one single step? And, uh, you know, as you know, uh, these need to be baby steps. If you want to create a habit, uh, they have to be small. You know, I know that uh, my personality style is, I would say, well, I'm going to lose weight. So then I <laughs> cut myself down to you know, 800 or 1,200 calories every day and sort of, as you want to say, white knuckle it and I lose all this weight and that's great until you don't anymore because it's not really a habit. You have just suffered and tortured yourself uh, to do something. So I think this idea of kindness to yourself and understanding that dramatic changes are not... Uh, don't turn into habits. Little steps turn into habits, and you can expand on those. So I think that's also uh, an important aspect. Oh, absolutely. And I love that, what you're saying. It absolutely is baby steps, because otherwise it's overwhelming and you just give up. And yet, all of these little habits day after day can make a huge, huge difference. So when is the book coming out? April 23rd, 2024. Well, I'm excited, and I'm sure that will be a bestseller like Happiness Track. And for those of you who may not uh, have read her first book, I would suggest you to you do so because it is a book not only filled with humanity, but also filled with science and gives one insights into how to be happy, which sadly for many of us is uh, a foreign concept. So, Emma, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, it's great to see you. I'm always uh, amazed by uh, how hard you work and the work you get done, and also the insights that you've gained from your own life journey that you're kind enough to share with so many of us. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Noni, for having me. Again, thank you for being with us today. The Into the Magic Shop podcast can be found where you find your most popular podcasts, or you can find us at intothemagicshop.com. Mm -hmm.